So chapter 33 looks at the history of Western art since the 1950s. And so this is usually considered the contemporary period. Since the 1950s, with the expansion of global markets, the spread of mass media and industry, um, artists have become increasingly pluralistic, responding to the world beyond art, embracing new media, and appropriating, reconceptualizing, and reimagining to produce radically new forms that express new ideas and content, even taking on complex social and political issues and challenging viewers to reconsider our own mortality, morality, behavior, and complacency. While there were some relatively unified movements and groups during this period, the art made during this time was really part of a complex network of diverse but related styles, practices, philosophical concerns, and interdisciplinary interests that emerged in the 1950s and early 60s. As your textbook notes, the inherent messiness of this period, characterized by creative thinkers in art, literature, music, dance, theater, science, and technology, working together in experimental and ephemeral formats, really defies traditions of art history and museums that privilege visual analysis of the material object, and it continues to present challenges today. So the generation of artists who began making art in 1950s, they were increasingly interested in the ordinary experiences of life and the visual culture of post-war America, and they sought to explore its conceptual implications within their artworks. Inspired by Cubist and Dada artists of the early 20th century, they mixed materials and media and incorporated everyday objects into real space and time, and expanded the idea of painting to include characteristics traditionally associated with sculpture and other creative disciplines. It's important to note that these artists were never really part of an organized or unified movement or style. However, the label Neo-Dada is sometimes applied because they tend tended to revive several artistic practices of Dada, including the use of collage, chance operations, and found objects, and because of the seemingly direct relation between their practices and the works of Marcel Duchamp. These artists wanted their works to be ironic and intellectually challenging, and they aimed to blur the distinctions between art and life, investigate the role of advertising and popular imagery in visual culture, critique the insistence on formalist interpretations of meaning, and to make fun of the elitism of high art. For the sake of our class, we're going to use the label Neo Dada to refer to the work of three particular artists, Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, and Louise Nevelson. But keep in mind, they did not refer to themselves as such. They were not a unified group or movement, and even though they were heavily influenced by it, they also drew inspiration from sources beyond Dada. Um, so we'll start with Robert Rauschenberg, who was born in Texas and studied in Paris uh, after World War II before attending Black Mountain College in North Carolina, a progressive liberal arts school that drew creative thinkers and became a hub of avant-garde innovation between about 1933 and 1956. Rauschenberg said, quote, painting relates to both art and life. Neither can be made. I try to act in the gap between the two. He directly challenged the dominant abstract expressionism in irreverent, often humorous ways. For example, in 1953, he asked William de Kooning to create a drawing that he could erase. De Kooning presented him with a drawing executed in heavy crayon, grease pencil, ink, and oil paint, so it took Rauschenberg over a month to erase the work completely. He then placed it in a gold frame and exhibited it as erased de Kooning drawing, ironically underscoring Rauschenberg's impulses to make his own creative work through an active process that negated de Kooning's and more generally abstract expressionism's expressive marks. By 1955, Rauschenberg had developed a distinctive style of assemblages, which he called combines, because they blended or combined elements of both painting and sculpture, as well as collage, using non-traditional materials and often found objects. 
These combines effectively exist within the space between media, as well as within the space between art and everyday life. So for example, this work from 1955 titled Bed incorporates a real quilt, sheets, and pillow with more conventional materials like paint and pencil onto a vertical wooden support about the same size as a twin mattress. Rauschenberg has added dripping splashes of paint in an ironic reference to abstract expressionist action painting that contrasts with the repeated geometric design of the patchwork quilt. The resulting work hangs on the wall like a painting, but projects outward into space like a sculpture, and juxtaposes the privacy and intimacy of one's bed with the public exhibition space. Anne Temkin, the curator at the Museum of Modern Art, says, quote, I think you can look at bed as a work that literally wanted to mess up the idea of painting as something pure and elegant, and instead say that painting could be something that's kind of bodily. I think he's wanted to kind of express the idea of a bed partly because you do think of a bed in association with all sorts of bodily functions, happy ones and unhappy ones. And there couldn't be any more direct way of saying art can be about our animal selves, not just our cerebral, intellectually, emotionally elevated selves. Uh, here's another combine. This one's from 1959, titled Canyon. And again, it exists sort of between media, combining elements of both painting and sculpture. Uh, Rauschenberg collages, family photos, a Statue of Liberty postcard, pieces of a man's shirt, flattened paint tubes, fragments of political posters, and a flattened steel drum with abstract expressionist paint splashes. A taxidermy eagle protrudes into the viewer's space, while a dirty pillow is suspended from a wooden beam attached near the bottom of the canvas. Rauschenberg refused the idea that art had its own special materials, stating a pair of socks is no less suitable to make a painting than wood, nails, turpentine, oil, and fabric. His combinations of objects, materials, and colors here serve as the formal elements of the composition and simultaneously refer to everyday life. Rauschenberg once explained his interest in everyday objects, saying, Having grown up in a very plain environment, if I was going to survive, I had to appreciate the most common aspects of life. Um, he grew up in Texas during the Great Depression, and much of the iconography in Canyon here comes from the everyday culture that he grew up in, and so there's also this personal relevance. Uh, for example, many scholars have noted that the dangling pillow seems to evoke maybe a pair of testicles, perhaps in relation to Rauschenberg's identity as a gay man in a homophobic age. Here's one more example, uh, again from 1959, this time titled Monogram. Of this work, Rauschenberg said, I was working with stuffed animals, and it was more to continue their life, because I always thought, it's too bad they're dead, and so I thought I can do something about that. As all my stories start, I was on the street, and I passed this second-hand office supply store. Uh, I saw this magnificent goat there. First, I tried to put it on a flat plane, and it was obviously too massive. It had too much character. It looked too much like itself that it couldn't compete with my painting. I took it off the wall, put it out in the room, and built an upright panel, but then it looked like he was a beast of burden. It kept looking as if, though, he was supposed to pull it. He still refused to be abstracted into art. It looked like art with a goat. And so I put the tire there, and then everything went to rest, and they lived happily ever after. Uh, so again, he's really challenging traditional artistic media here, and moving away from formalism. He's incorporated objects and materials that reference everyday life, but that also have a deeper, more personal relevance as well. The title monogram plays on the way that the tire encircles the goat, which reminded Rauschenberg of the interlocking letters of a monogram, and the artist's initials show up as collaged wooden letters elsewhere on the platform. Uh, some scholars have again related the content of monogram to Rauschenberg's status as a gay man in a time when that wasn't as widely accepted. Uh, goats have traditionally been used to symbolize masculinity and strength in various cultures, and the act of penetrating the tire may be a sort of sexual innuendo. 
Uh, again, he's incorporated some abstract expressionist paint splatters, this time on the goat's face. And then the horizontal orientation of the canvas kind of recalls Jackson Pollock's method of painting on canvas flat on the floor. But if we spin this around and kind of look from the back, we can see that Rauschenberg has also incorporated this dirty tennis ball just behind the goat as if to metaphorically and somewhat literally defecate on abstract expressionist theories, approaches, and the resulting compositions, and to sort of make fun of the commonplace understanding of abstract expressionism as ballsy. Jasper Johns moved to New York City in 1952, where he met Robert Rauschenberg. Inspired by his combines, as well as by the work of Marcel Duchamp, Johns combined assemblage with painting techniques to address formal and conceptual issues in art and to satirize the dominant abstract expressionist style. For example, this 1954-1955 flag is one of several works in which Johns appropriates the iconic emblem of the American flag. By painting a flag, something that is inherently flat, Johns dispensed with any need for the illusion of deep space, easily achieving the flat, all-over composition that formalists loved. Um, the flag, it, it does cover the composition from edge to edge, and as with action painting, the surface is rather heavily textured with marks that appear gestural, but Johns has actually carefully shaped and placed these lumps and splotches. He used the ancient painting technique of encaustic, molten beeswax mixed with pigment, carefully molding the layers of uh, wax with his brush or his palette knife. Because the wax dried fast, he could superimpose one textured mark over another quite quickly without smearing any of the underlying layers. The careful use of encaustic subverts the spontaneity of Pollock and others. Uh, Johns also lavishly used collage, incorporating fragments of newspapers to this canvas. Um, and because the colored encaustic is quite translucent, the newspaper clippings can be read in some places. Um, so this is, uh, this is not the same exact flag as the previous slide, but um, one of the same era, and of course it's very similar. Um, but I've included this with this detail here, so you can kind of see uh, the legibility of those newspaper clippings. Um, now, Johns is often labeled Neo-Dada because in many ways he posed the same question that Duchamp had posed with his ready-mades about 40 years earlier. What makes one thing art and another thing an everyday object? Is this a painting of a flag or is it an actual flag? It could function as a flag if needed, but it is also recognizable enough that patriotic people might be upset if someone cut, burned, or wrote negative slogans across it. For scholars, the legible fragments of newspapers suggest possible references to the political climate of the day. The symbolism of the national flag is complex in any era, but Cold War hysteria about communism was gripping many Americans in 1955, causing them to question each other's patriotism and loyalty. Johns himself said he simply wanted viewers to look at something, um, excuse me, to look at an object such as the flag the same way you look at a radiator, he said. He described the American flag as, quote, something the mind already knows. And he went on to paint more flags and other common graphic symbols, such as targets, maps, stenciled numbers, and words. Using familiar objects gives me room to work on other levels, he's explained. Um, so other works like his target with four faces and target with plaster casts combine sculpture and assemblage with painting techniques. So like Rauschenberg, he's really working in the space between. And again, he's challenging formal and conceptual contentions in art, but he's also kind of asking psychological questions about the perceptions of the self in the modern era. So like the flag, the target here is inherently flat. It's a recognizable subject, something that the mind already knows. Um, and again, it sort of asks, what makes one thing art and another thing an everyday object? This is a painting of a target, but if we wanted or needed it to be, it could function as a target as well. 
The concentric circles are already a kind of abstracted design that extend from one edge of the composition to the other, but Johns has again used encaustic and he carefully builds up these sinuous, translucent layers of encaustic and collage that obscure the target and visually mimic yet physically defy the spontaneity of abstract expressionism. Above the targets, Johns mounts a series of plaster casts. Um, here on the left, with target and four faces, he includes four fragmentary plaster cast faces arranged within wooden niches, with a single hinged wooden lid. On the right, he includes fragmented plaster casts of various body parts, including a face, a foot, hand, ear, and a penis, this time with individually hinged wooden flaps. Uh, closing the lids further depersonalizes the individual by obliterating all or just a selected part of the human presence. There's this strange sense of both intimacy and privacy and of being fractured by an anemone. The combination of fragmented and partially hidden body parts with the targets evokes ideas of paranoia, being targeted, or even firing squads. Ideas that take on an even richer meaning when we consider that Jasper Johns was also a gay artist living and working in the very restrictive, paranoid climate of Cold War America. So, somewhat similarly to Rauschenberg and Johns, Louise Nevelson was inspired by Dada's use of found objects, their interest in spontaneity, and their rebellious questioning of the conception of art. But she was a bit more specifically drawn to the visual appearances of cubist collages and assemblages. While Johns and Rauschenberg worked in the spirit of Duchamp, repurposing recognizable objects from everyday life, Nevelson sought to transform her found materials into abstract compositions. She explained, quote, I am the reverse of Mr. Duchamp, optimistic. I believe there is something new under the sun. I feel that when we need new forms, they will appear. Abstraction is the form of our time. The age in which we're living is dynamic. Artists must be unique. I think this is the richest time in creative history. I believe our art is important. We must go ahead. There is no turning back. In the mid to late 1950s, Nevelson began creating assemblages of wooden boxes and crates, chair legs, broom handles, cabinet doors, and other wooden refuse. She used the rectangular box forms to organize and arrange more irregular forms. Uh, playing with light and shadow, form and its absence, these assemblages transform the garbage of everyday life into evocative, seemingly abstract forms. She then unifies the fragmented forms by painting the compositions matte black, white, or gold. The monochromatic color schemes help to obscure the identity of the individual elements and to evoke some sense of mood. Nevelson began using found boxes in her sculptures in about 1957, later connecting the development of this technique to her earlier junk collecting habits in New York. She said, quote, long before I used such pieces in sculpture, I'd walk on the street and I'd see something and I'd bring it home. I used to put it on a shelf. Um, one origin story for her so-called walls is founded on the artist's recognition that a liquor crate with divisions for bottles was in itself a sculpture, a ready-made of sorts. Another source suggests that it was the discovery of a long box designed to hold rugs on the street that she's found and it sort of spurred her interest in such ready-made forms as the structural basis for her sculpture. She claimed that the box at that time was a promise to me. Nevelson's chosen material of wood resonates with the rich cultural associations that wood has earned from its practical uses in everyday life. She once explained, we have lived with wood through the ages, the furniture in the house, the floors of the house. Nevelson claimed to work in wood because the medium was immediate and it allowed her to work almost spontaneously. But she also said, quote, my work is not wood, it is only made of wood. It's got to transcend that material. As a rectangular plane viewed from the front, 
Nevelson's works such as this, Sky Cathedral, have the pictorial quality of paintings, but they quickly reveal richly layered depth. Sky Cathedral is constructed of shallow open boxes fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle. These contain moldings, dowels, spindles, chair parts, architectural ornaments, and scroll-like fragments, all painted matte black. She's heightened the poetic element of the work by displaying it in sort of this soft blue light, which recalls moonlight. Like her contemporaries Mark Rothko and Barnett Newman, Nevelson was interested in the sublime and in spiritual transcendence. Sky Cathedral, like many of her wall pieces, evokes the sense of a shrine or a place of devotion. The artist wrote that in her art, she sought, quote, the in-between places, the dawns and dusk, the objective world, the heavenly spheres, the places between land and the sea.